Dear viewers, we have two exciting announcements to assist you in your mains and prelims preparation. Those who have missed to enroll into the most reliable prelims test series offered by Shankar IS Academy, your wait is over. Pre-storming batch 3 is starting on November 9th. The first test in this batch will commence on 20th November. Like the other batches, it will also have 66 tests. Now for mains examination, you all are aware about the mains booster 2023 under which you will be provided 40 mains oriented tests in 90 days. The booster is a quick plan drafted for you to boost your main score. It starts today that is on October 31st and it will include sectional tests, off papers and civil service examination emulators. It is available in both online and offline modes for just 4500 rupees. Grab these chances to kickstart your prelims and mains preparation. With this, let me welcome you all to the Hindu Daily News Analysis for the date 31st of October 2022. The articles taken up for today's discussion are displayed here. You can have a look. With this, let's start our first article discussion. Take a look at this editorial. It is written in the context of the recent issue created by the Governor of Kerala. The Kerala Governor recently tweeted that the statements of individual ministers that lower the dignity of the office of Governor can invite action including withdrawal of pleasure. The Governor also sent a letter to the Kerala Chief Minister saying that the Finance Minister of Kerala does not enjoy the Governor's pleasure and he also asked the Kerala Chief Minister to act against the State Finance Minister. But the Kerala Chief Minister ignored it. The Kerala Governor's action can be seen in relation to Article 164 Class 1 of the Indian Constitution, which says that the ministers shall hold office during the pleasure of the Governor. So basically, the Governor of Kerala was trying to remove the Finance Minister of the State from his office citing that he did not enjoy the pleasure of the Governor. See, in a quasi-federal country like India, the conflict between the Governor and the State Government is bound to happen. This is why issues and challenges pertaining to the federal structure is in our syllabus. See, in this discussion today, we will see about the origin and the evolution of the office of the governor, the need for the office of governor in India and some points mentioned in the editorial. See, between Regulating Act 1773 and Charter Act 1833, the colonial government was centralizing the administration of British India. Regulating Act 1773 transformed the office of Governor of Bengal into Governor General of Bengal, making Lord Warren Hastings as the first Governor General of Bengal. Also note that this particular act made the governors of the presidencies like Bombay and Madras subordinate to the Governor General of Bengal. The centralization process culminated in the Charter Act 1833 where the Office of Governor General of Bengal was transformed into the Office of Governor General of India. Here note that Lord William Bentick was the first Governor General of India. The 1833 Charter Act even removed the legislative powers of the governors of the other two presidencies. But after 1857, when the Crown took control of India, decentralization process started. Government of India Act 1858 placed the governor under the supervision of the viceroy. It was Indian Councils Act 1861 that restored the legislative powers of the governors of the other presidencies that is Bombay and Madras. Then a major reform was brought about by the Government of India Act 1919. Pay attention here. It introduced the concept of diarchy in the provinces. See, in diarchy, the provincial list was divided into reserved and transferred list. The governor of the province had control over the subjects in the reserved list and the power of the council of ministers responsible to the provincial legislatures was only limited to the transferred list. The governor of the provinces also had veto power over the decision of the council. So ultimately, diarchy reduced the power of the elected representatives and increased the power of the unelected governor who was appointed by the crown. The reforms ended with the Government of India Act 1935. In the Government of India Act 1935, diarchy was abolished in the provincial levels and it was finally introduced in the central level. So, for around three decades, diarchy was present either at the provincial level or at the central level. 
See, our national leaders experienced the bitter experience of diarchy. The leaders argued that how does a governor have precedence over the elected representatives of the people? It was due to such bitter experience that there were fierce battles surrounding the office of governor while the constitution was being framed. Even after such lengthy debates, the constitution assembly moved forward with the post of governor and even offered the post of governor some discretionary powers. Here note that the constitution makers who supported the post of governor mentioned two points in favor of it. The first point is that there were no competent legislators in the states. This makes union government to appoint a well-qualified governor necessary for the proper functioning of the state apparatus. See, this statement was particularly related to the period of immediate post-independent India. Now, coming to the next point. India gained independence with the bitter experience of partition and the communal violence associated with it. So, the constitution makers believed that some centralization is necessary for a nascent democracy like India to ensure territorial integrity and prevent further balkanization of the country. By mentioning these two points, the constitution makers defended the post of governor and his discretionary powers. But whether these two points are still valid is a big question. So, till now in our discussion, we saw about the evolution of the position of governor and the need for the office of governor in the post-independent India. Now, let us see the points mentioned in this particular editorial. The editorial talks about two articles. They are articles 163 and 164. In the start of our discussion, we saw that the governor quoted Article 164, Class 1, right? See, Article 164, Class 1 states that the governor shall appoint the chief minister and all other ministers are appointed by the governor on the advice of the chief minister. This particular article also mentions that the ministers shall hold office during the pleasure of the governor. The Kerala governor read into it quite literally. According to the author of the editorial, Article 164.1 must be read along with Article 163. Article 163 Class 1 says that the governor should act in accordance with aid and advice of the Council of Ministers headed by the Chief Minister. So, during the pleasure of the governor mentioned in Article 164 Class 1 is in reality the pleasure of the Chief Minister. The governor cannot use the provision under Article 164 Class 1 to dismiss a ministry while the chief minister still enjoys a majority in the legislature. So, basically, the governor is only the title or head like the president of India. But unlike our president, the governor has some constitutional discretion. According to Article 163 Class 2, the governor can act at his discretion in certain matters. What this actually means is that governor is generally bound by the cabinet decision except when he has a legitimate right to invoke his discretion. See, earlier during this discussion, I asked a question, right? I asked whether two points that necessitated the creation of the position of governor and discretion are still valid in the 21st century. The answer for that question is no. Those two points are obsolete now. The states now have competent legislators and the issue of secession from the Indian Union is practically non-existent now. So, the position of the governor should not be used to affect the day-to-day -day functioning of the state and the governors must act in such a way to further the spirit of federalism. This particular sentiment was highlighted by Justice B. R. Krishna Iyer in Shamsar Singh v. State of Punjab 1974 case. The justice said that even though powers and functions of president and governors are mentioned in the constitution, the actual business must be carried out by the council of ministers who are directly elected by people's vote and responsible to the legislature. So, basically, president and governors should not overextend their position for the democracy to function well. This is all with regarding to what is written in the editorial. Through this discussion, we learned about the Evolution of Office of Governor from the period of British India to the post-independent India. We also saw about the need for the Office of Governor during the immediate period after the independence. Finally, we saw about the need for the Office of Governor in the present times. With this information, now let's move on to the next article discussion. Take a look at this news article.
இட் டாக்ஸ் அபவுட் தி ரீசன்ட் ஈவெண்ட் ஆர்கனைஸ்டு பை எஸ் சிஆர்பிஎஃப் பெட்டாலியன் சி த நேஷனல் யுனைடி டே ஆர் தி ராஷ்டிரிய ஏக்தா திவாஸ் இஸ் செலப்ரேட்டட் எவ்ரி இயர் டு மார்க் தி பர்த் அனிவர்சரி ஆஃப் சர்தார் வல்லபாய் பட்டேல் டு ஹைலைட் திஸ் ஈவெண்ட் பர்சனல் ஆஃப் தி சிஆர்பிஎஃப் ஒன் ஃபிஃப்டி ஒன் பெட்டாலியன் ஆர்கனைஸ்டு பை கண் சைக்கிள் ரேலி திஸ் இஸ் அபவுட் தி நியூஸ் ஆர்டிகல் இன் திஸ் கண்டெக்ஸ்ட் லெட் அஸ் ரிவைஸ் அபவுட் தி சென்ட்ரல் ஆம்டு போலீஸ் ஃபோர்ஸ் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் எ கொஷின் போலீஸ் அண்ட் பப்ளிக் ஆர்டர் ஆர் பிளேஸ்ட் அண்டர் விச் லிஸ்ட் இன் தி ஷெடியூல் செவன் ஆஃப் தி கான்ஸ்டியூஷன் I hope you all have guessed it right. Police and public order are placed under the state list. However, the Union Ministry of Home Affairs assists state government by providing them support of the Central Armed Police Forces. Here, the Central Armed Police Forces include Assam Rifles, Border Security Force, Central Industrial Security Force, Central Reserve Police Force, Indo-Tibetan Border Police, National Security Guard and finally Sahastra Seema Ball. all of them have their own primary roles and apart from that all capfs are involved in assisting police in law and order situations and also army in counter terrorist operations now let us see a few points about each force first let us take assam rifles see the assam rifles came into being in 1835 itself it was initially raised as a militia and was called as chachar levy This was formed initially to protect British tea estates and the British settlements against northeast tribal rights. Right now the Assam Rifles is tasked with the maintenance of law and order in the northeast along with the Indian army and it also guards the Indo-Myanmar border. One unique feature of Assam Rifles is that it is the only paramilitary force with a dual control structure. While the administrative control of the force is with the Ministry of Home Affairs Its operational control is with the Indian Army which is under the Ministry of Defence. Moving on to the Border Security Force. The BSF is considered as the first line of defence for the Indian territories. It was raised in 1965 after the Indo-Pakistan War. Right now it is deployed on the Indo-Pakistan border and also along the Indo-Bangladeshi border. Here note that the BSF has an air wing, marine wing, artillery regiment and also commando units. then there is ITBP which is nothing but Indo-Tibetan border force see it was raised in the year 1962 after the Indo-China war right now it is deployed along the Indian China border ITBP is a specialized mountain force as it covers the rugged terrain along the India China border now let us take the Sastra Seema Ball it was raised in the year 1963 this unit is deployed along Indo-Nepal and Indo-Bhutan borders These four that we just saw now are the border guarding forces of the CAPF. These CISF and CRPF are the forces dedicated to internal security. Now let us see briefly about Central Industrial Security Force which is also known as CISF. It came into existence in the year 1969. This force was raised to provide integrated security cover to the public sector undertakings. Right now CISF provides security cover to critical infrastructure installations like the nuclear power plants space establishments airports sea ports power plants sensitive government buildings and even heritage monuments the cisf also provides security cover to the delhi metro now finally coming to crpf see it was initially called as crown's representative police After the CRPF Act of 1949 it took up the name CRPF the Central Reserve Police Force aids the government in maintaining rule of law public order internal security and national integrity finally coming to the elite force which is called as National Security Guard see NSG is a special task force of the CAPF it is a specialized counter terrorism unit raised in the year 1984 It is raised to tackle all facets of terrorism inside the borders of the country. These are all the seven central armed police force units present in India. Through this discussion, we have learned about CAPF and the seven organizations present under it. With this, let's move on to the next article. Take a look at this news article. It says that Uttar Pradesh government confirmed dolphins have begun returning to the Ganga. It has been made possible due to the improvement in river water quality made possible by the Namami Ganga program. So in this news article discussion let us learn about Gangetic Dolphins. 
See, the gangetic dolphins are a species of toothed whale. Unlike other dolphins which live in salt waters, gangetic dolphins live only in fresh water. As their name itself indicates, they live in the Ganges and related rivers of South Asia. To be very specific, Ganges river dolphins live in the Ganges, Brahmaputra, Meghna and Karnafuli Sangu river systems of Nepal, India and Bangladesh. It is related to the much smaller Indus river dolphin which lives in the Indus river in Pakistan. Remember, Ganges dolphins are also known by the name Shushu in Assamese language and Shushuk in Bengali language. The Ganges river dolphin has been recognized by the government of India as its national aquatic animal and it is also the official animal of the Indian city of Gauhati in Assam. Now coming to its characteristics. See, the dolphin has a sturdy yet flexible body with large flippers and a low triangular dorsal fin. It weighs up to 150 kgs. They are generally blind and catch their prey using a unique technique. They emit an ultrasonic sound which reaches the prey. The dolphin then registers this image in its mind and subsequently catches hold of its prey. Talking about their habitat. See, Ganges river dolphins prefer deep waters and they also prefer living in areas around the confluence of rivers. They are a very important species because they function as an reliable indicator of the health of the entire river ecosystem. So, to put it short, it serves as the indicator species of the ecosystem in which it lives. Now, coming to the conservation status of the Ganges dolphin. See, they are protected under Schedule 1 of the Indian Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Secondly, they also come under the endangered list according to the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Additionally, they are protected under Appendix 1 of Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. This is all with regard to gangetic dolphins. Through this discussion, we came to know about gangetic dolphins, its primary habitat, and most importantly about its conservation status. With this information, now let's move on to the next article. Have a look at this news article. It reports that yesterday our Prime Minister in his Mon Ki Baat address said that the simultaneous placement of 36 one-web satellites into the low earth orbit would strengthen digital connectivity across the country. So here, what does this one-web satellites mean? We will see about that in this news article discussion. See, OneWeb is a London-based satellite communication company that aims to build broadband satellite internet services. The OneWeb satellite constellation is a planned 648 satellite internet constellation which is in the process of being completed in the year 2022. The goal of this constellation is to provide global broadband internet services by the end of the 2023. As of this month, 462 satellites have been already deployed in the low earth orbits around the globe. Here note that the last deployment of 36 OneWeb satellites has been done by India. Yes, in April 2022, the OneWeb entered into a partnership with the New Space India Limited, which is nothing but a commercial arm of the Indian Space Research Organization. As part of this deal, it was agreed that the 14th launch of the company's low earth satellites will take place on the newly introduced GSLV Mark III. And very recently, that is on 23rd October 2022, 36 OneWeb satellites were launched successfully by the GSLV Mark III. Here note that ISRO has said from now on, GSLV Mark III is to be called as Launch Vehicle Mark III. So, if you come across a question in the prelims saying that GSLV Mark III and Launch Vehicle Mark III are two different rocket systems of ISRO, that statement is wrong. So, with this basic information, now let us see some of the features of this OneWeb satellite constellation. See, the constellation is a network of low earth orbit satellites. The said satellites will remain close to the earth's surface at an altitude of less than 1000 km. As I already said, the intent of this constellation is to provide high-speed internet at low latency. Since low earth satellites are much closer to earth than the middle earth orbit satellites, the receivers on the earth will enjoy much stronger signals than those provided by the middle earth orbit satellites. 
This results in better indoor coverage and improved protection from jamming. This is all with regard to the OneWeb constellation. Through this discussion, we saw some facts regarding OneWeb and ISRO's newly introduced launch vehicle Mark III. With this, let's move on to the next news article. Take a look at this news article. See, this news article talks about an allegation made by West Bengal Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee. Yesterday, she claimed that a section of people has seized democratic powers which could lead to the country adopting a presidential form of government. Let's not get deeper into this issue. Instead, let us understand the key differences between the both forms of government that is presidential form and the prime ministerial form. See, there are basically two forms of democratic government systems around the world. India follows a parliamentary system modelled on Britain's parliamentary form of government. As you know, the role of the Prime Minister in a parliamentary system is so significant and crucial, the parliamentary form of government is also known as Prime Ministerial Government. The accusation in the today's article has been made because in the presidential form of government, there is relatively more centralization of power than the parliamentary form of government. Now, with this basic understanding, let us investigate the difference between the two forms of government. Coming to the first difference. See, in a presidential system, the head of the government leads an executive that is distinct from the legislature. Here, the head of the government and the head of the state are one and the same. Take the case of US president. He is both the head of the state and the head of the government. That is, as the head of the state, the president occupies a ceremonial position. And as the head of the government, he leads the executive organ of the government. Unlike the presidential form of government, the head of the state in a parliamentary system is usually a person distinct from the head of the government. In England, crown is the head of the state, while prime minister is the head of the government. While in India, president acts as the head of the state. Now, coming to the second difference. See, in the presidential system of government, the executive is not accountable to the legislature. In the prime ministerial form, the executive is accountable to the legislature. That is, the executive is answerable to the legislature for its action and its authority is also limited by the checks and balances of the parliament. Question or's in the parliament is the designed mechanism for this purpose. Now, coming to the third difference. Know that the president has a fixed tenure in the presidential form. For example, Take the case of US, the president can only be impeached from the office for grave offences which include treason, bribery or other high crimes. So generally, the president has a fixed tenure in the presidential form of government. In the parliamentary form, the president does or does not have a fixed tenure. But note here, in the case of India, president has been provided with a fixed tenure, that is 5 years. Now, coming to the fourth difference, this is a key one, so kindly pay attention. In the presidential form, people outside the legislature can also be appointed as ministers. That is, the ministers in the presidential form doesn't need to be members of the legislature. But in the case of parliamentary system, ministers can only be chosen from among MPs. For example, in India, a person who is not a member of either house of parliament can also be appointed as a minister. But within six months, he or she must become a member of either house of parliament. Otherwise, he ceases to be a minister. Now, coming to the final difference. Note that in the presidential form of government, the president cannot dissolve the house of representatives or the lower house. While in the case of parliamentary system, the lower house of the parliament, that is the Lok Sabha, can be dissolved by the president on the recommendation of the prime minister. This case is particular to that of India. This is all with regard to the differences between the presidential form of government and the parliamentary form of government. Through this discussion, we came to know about all the key differences present between the both forms of government. With this, we have come to the end of the first part of our discussion. Now, moving to the second part, that is nothing but the prelims practice question discussion. Today, we have taken two different questions for our discussion. Let's start with the first question. Let me read out the question first for you. With reference to Gangetic Dolphins, consider the following statements. Statement 1. It's the only species of freshwater dolphin in the world. If you have paid close attention to what I had discussed in the discussion today, then you would have known that this statement is wrong. 
See, it is one among four freshwater dolphins present in the world today. The other river dolphins are presented in the map here. You can have a look. Now, coming to the second statement. It is classified under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. This statement is absolutely correct. Regarding this, we have seen in the discussion itself. Now, coming to the third statement. Vikramashila Gangetic Dolphin Sanctuary in Bihar's Bahalpur district is India's only sanctuary for Gangetic Dolphins. This statement is correct. Let me give you a few further facts regarding this sanctuary. See, this sanctuary is located in Bahalpur district of Bihar and it is about 60 km long from Sultan Ganj to Kahal Gowan in Bhagalpur district. It was notified as Vikramashila Gangetic Dolphin Sanctuary in 1991. Also note that it is the only protected area for the endangered Gangetic Dolphins in Asia. So, statement 3 is correct. Now, coming to the question, which of the above given statements are correct? So, the correct answer for this question is option C, 2 and 3 only. Now, moving on to the second question. See, this is a previous year prelims question. So, kindly pay attention. Let me read out the question first. We adopted parliamentary democracy based on the British model. But how does our democracy differ from that model? Statement 1. As regards legislation, the British Parliament is supreme or sovereign. But in India, the power of the Parliament to the legislature is limited. This statement is correct. Also note that the British Parliament is supreme since the Britain doesn't have any written constitution. The British legislature is installed with powers to make laws according to the needs of the time, which is not the case in India. In India, we have a basic structure doctrine so that the amending power of the parliament is very much limited. Statement 1 is correct. Now coming to the second statement. In India, matters related to the constitutionality of the amendment of an act of the parliament are referred to the constitution bench by the Supreme Court. This statement is absolutely correct. Article 13 of the Indian constitution gives the necessary power for the Supreme Court to judicially review the amendments of the constitution. Now, coming to the answer of the question, since both the statements are correct, the correct answer for this question is option C, both 1 and 2. Now, moving on to the quiz questions for the day. I have given two different quiz questions for you. Interested aspirants can post the correct answer in the comment section. The mains practice question is displayed here. Interested aspirants can write your answers and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of our discussion. If you have liked our video, Please hit the like button, do comment and share it with your friends. Thank you for listening.